Professor Helios, did you kill your son? How dare you! It's time to head back to the Emergence Universe and take a look at the Nine. Greetings comic lovers and welcome back to Casually Comics, the channel where we chat all things comics, from music comics new and old, to history to anecdotes, really wherever our whims take us. Today I'm once more partnered with Interpop, who I had originally partnered with to tell you about hashtag ZoeMG. Although I initially said hashtag ZoeOMG, but then someone in the comments said it should be ZoeMG, like oh my god, and you know what? I agree with their pronunciation, I'm gonna go with that. Also the hashtag you don't have to say it. It's silent, but if you're gonna read a title, you gotta read the hashtag. Now, Zoe was a superhero with emotional manipulation powers that manifested as emojis around her and also had the side effect that people could always tell what she was feeling. But also, she can just project feelings at people. It's actually a pretty intense power. Her story was about coming to terms with the extent of her power and deciding what she was going to do with them, all while navigating teen awkwardness and finding herself pulled into a superhero murder mystery. I mentioned in that video that she was part of a larger universe, that this was a story spotlighting her. And you all, for the most part, were intrigued and wanted to hear more. You responded so well, I'm happy to say that I'm partnering with Interpop again to tell you more about their universe. We're going to be looking at why at the time of this recording is the main highlight of that universe, the Nine. It's expanding outwards, and the Nine are the focal point, and then everything else is a tendril that builds upon it. Interpop, who has their comic work at interpopcomics.com, are a company set on creating a wholly digital comic experience for readers, and an interactive one. Their comics are available solely for digital purchase. You can purchase them with your usual currency or with cryptocurrency. People who purchase the comics are eligible to take part in votes about storylines pertaining to the issues they purchased. And these are things that will have an impact. Now this, it must be noted, is a concept that fills some with excitement about the potential for a collaborative universe and a positive fan creator relationship, and others with dread, as they worry it could lead to a lack of agency for creators, or take the story in a direction they may not necessarily want to go. Now the site also functions by allowing you to purchase these comics as NFTs. Interpop is committed to an environmentally sound NFT generator. They're specifically on the Tezos blockchain network, which is a proof of stake network that consumes over 2 million times less energy than proof of work networks, and it's constantly updating to lower its carbon footprint. However, as always, once you do their own research and put their money where they feel comfortable. The comics on interpotcomics.com do become free to read after a time, and this is for anyone who visits the site and then they remain so from that point onward. The free issues are housed on the free to read page that has all the free segments up so far, so you can catch up. There's plenty to check out on there. They first release in chapters and then as a whole free issue. The money that is generated from purchases on standard issues and special edition variants covers is used to allow for this free format without a subscription-based service, and to improve the site, its interactivity, and also side projects overall. For example, they do have a trading card game. Now, the concept is trying to build a whole new superhero universe from the ground up, also utilizing an, at this point, unique strategy to do so intrigued me. So I thought I would share it with you and see what you thought. So in this case, I'm going to give you an overview of the first few issues, so you can get a sense of what's going on. Time of recording, issue three is the one that is the most recent that's coming out. The story of the Nine overall follows the crime blotter, Denny Goodwin. In this first Zero issue, we see him go from the crime blotter to the time blotter. You have to decide how you feel about the word blotter in a superhero name, blot. He is here charged of bringing together a group of heroes that will be called the Nine for some cosmic purpose. And this cosmic being picked the right person because he already had a conspiracy theorist cork board in his living room. Our star protagonist, Denny Goodwin, is a street level hero whose power is an innate connection to the city itself. And now as a result, he can also follow these connections and see things that other people can't. So he also has a job as a reporter, which allows him access and the excuse to constantly be looking for and gathering information. His office has some cute Easter eggs, notes on the wall, call Lois, fire Parker, poor Peter, even in other universes it is in his day. Now the nine number zero is our big setup and the one that they hope will hook you into the universe. It's written by Will Pfeiffer, with art by Steve Ellis, colors by Christopher Sotomayor, and lettering by Carlos Mangual. Ellis also did the main cover, which is a split cover showing Denny both as the crime blotter and the time blotter. Now, Denny was a member of the street-level hero gang, The Upstarts, who disbanded after an instant that will slowly become more clear as the issues unfold, as it becomes the instant that forms the central crux of the mystery. An instant involving the villain, Phaeton. Side note, this is spelled in such a way? It's one of those words, you could say it a lot of ways. How would you say it? Tell me. I'm going to put it on the screen. Tell me how you'd say it. Feel free. Roast me. I say that. Someone's going to take it way too far. Now, Denny's laying low since this instant, and he's now working in a tabloid, whereas before he worked for a big conglomerate, but he found the tabloid more honest. Shots fired. He's been given the assignment to cover a fan-made superhero museum, largely because it's being created and curated by the owner's nephew. That's the tabloid owner's nephew. He's recreated the day of the incident where a whole bunch of the city was destroyed. This exhibit may receive some complaints. These are officially licensed action figures. Thankfully, the upstarts aren't worth much, so I don't feel bad. 
unboxing them. You know, this panel really made me think about the things Clark must have heard back when he had a secret identity. Wishful thinking, maybe it's the future and he has it again. Time of recording. Must have snapped many a pencil. This curator even hired a graffiti artist to recreate some of the popular graffiti going around the city Phaeton lives, just for his museum. Cause this incident also occupies a lot of the city's minds as well. Although it does take a while for you to come to grasp how you're supposed to view Phaeton. The depth and gravity of what he's done takes a while to be conveyed. So it's not the strongest part of what's going on here. It's here that Denny first encounters the Tome of Time, which this curator was sold under the pretext that it really is a cosmic book and that this isn't even its final form. The book hammers home the fact that Denny's been feeling out of step with time for a while, like feeling that the museum opened a year ago, or the fact that all his favorite shows feel like reruns. He looks solid back to Phaeton and his disappearance. That it changed not only the upstarts, actually they disbanded because they were so shaken by the fact that they couldn't help and stop the situation or save the city. It was a very disillusioning experience, whatever it was. But it also changed the Genesis Squadron, the original founding heroes of the universe. Denny, as crime blogger, sets out to talk to Professor Helios, one of the founding members of the Genesis Squadron, long since retired, and a teacher at the Phaeton Project, a school to teach youth about their powers and how to control them to avoid another Phaeton incident. We also learned throughout this that the crime blotter was a mentor to Phaeton, and also, something that not everybody knows, the Professor Helios was Phaeton's father. So the school is also a kind of covert way to honor his fallen son, his fallen and disgraced son. So slowly you start to fill in the gaps, but it's really in reading the whole arc that all of what's going on with Phaeton becomes clearer and you get more invested in it. There are other things to be invested in around that though. Though that tends to the mark of a decent arc that it builds upon itself. Some of it is arc building, some of it's growing pains. Denny goes to confront the professor and he has no chill at all. Professor Helios, did you kill your son? Professor Helios takes it well. How dare you? And he ignites the building they're on. Earned. This sets off a chain of events where it appears that the crime blotter has been killed trying to take out Professor Helios. Only he wasn't and he hasn't. But he manages to escape unscathed, but he's completely disoriented and even more out of it than usual. He staggers to work, passes out, he ends up going home, and on his way there he finds that the Tome of Time is in his pocket, but it's now in a completely different shape. It's bigger. As he flips through the book, it takes him to moments in time. Out of step though, not quite right. And then he makes a decision. He's gonna skip to the end. By doing that, it takes him to a cosmic entity who tells him he must assemble the Nine to save the world. And he sees a shadowy image of who the Nine are, which he's later able to piece together. When Denny returns, he's different, changed. He takes the very pages of the tome to make a new version of his costume that will allow him to travel in time and renames himself the Time Blotter. Crime Blotter may be dead, but Time Blotter lives. Now he looks even more like a mummy. He's got so much paper on him, he can blot anything. This zero issue has some strong points and some weaknesses. Time travel is always a hard sell for some people. The potential for confusion and paradoxes run high. And while part of the disjointedness of this issue is meant to symbolize Denny coming unstuck in time, some may find it jarring or just awkward. You do get a good sense of Denny here. The type of man he is. Intelligent, serious, a little jaded, but also grounded and methodical. You saw his corkboard. He's also very isolated. So so there is a part of you, if you do end up enjoying him as a character, that wants to see him kind of bring this team together and have some people to talk to. He's in full noir protagonist narration mode. He needs people. This issue does set up some of the core concepts of the universe, the various hero teams, a timeline of events, and a mystery. The only thing again is that Phaeton incident. It's really going to be hit or miss whether you're interested in finding out what happened or not. The attempt to keep it enigmatic causes it at times to feel disconnected. We're meant to care about Phaeton, but you don't get a full sense of why. Even when you learn about the connection to other characters, you don't fully feel Denny's connection until later issues. The thing is, the Emergence verse is truly an interconnected one, and it really does function at its utmost when you go and read everything all together. You can read it independently, but it's a richer tapestry if you do go and experience all of them. For me, issue zero held enough that I was interested in that I want to know more. And now is a good time if you are interested, because you can hop straight into issue one for free. Although in my mind, it's issue two, because to hop in at issue one, you could do it without reading issue zero, but you might have a bit of a time. A lot happened to Denny in issue zero. Same creative team, go! Crime Blotter is trying to figure out how to approach assembling the Nine. He knows who he needs, but not where to start. He also can't seem to send himself back directly to the incident itself. He can get to moments around it, but he can't get there specifically. There's also a moment that he sees one of the founding heroes, Xeroth, talking with his cosmic goddess, and he can't figure that out either. Xeroth is also somebody he needs for the Nine, so that's also concerning him. He also has to attend his own funeral, while his 
hero self's funeral. And he gets to see his friends speak there, and this part is very interestingly handled. Since they know his real identity, and he went to work the morning after this incident, they know he's not dead. But they still have to go out there and make speeches as if he is. And so when he sees them later, they have some interesting reactions to being put through that. One of these heroes is Devastatrix, his former love interest and a hero who has turned pro fighter. There's also Shimmerstorm, a hero who exists in multiple moments in time. They do this cool thing with her where her dialogue bubbles are overlapping each other or she appears out of phase or duplicated. Now his funeral is a bit of a contentious event because it looked like he was trying to kill Professor Helios. So there are people with strong feelings on both sides who attend. It turns to a bit of a brawl. Also here we're introduced to Coax, a student from the school, who has the power to manifest illusions. And Zoe is here too. They use their powers to try and make it better and they make it so much worse. Just illusions everywhere, projecting emotions. Their powers are very interesting when you attempt to apply them to a heroic setting. They're usually villain powers. Time decides that he's gonna go for the founding heroes first. He's gonna get Helios and Zero. He just accosts them and shows them his powers. Just get right to it. This includes taking the professor to a time where his son was alive. It's just zero tact. None. This does not go down well, especially when Time Blotter explains that Phaeton is meant to be part of the Nine, and so he might not be dead, which is the general assumption after the incident. All of these hops around, however, start to breed discord between Helios and Zero, especially after they see him with the cosmic woman. And Time Blotter still doesn't have the greatest handle on his powers and so he ends up just skipping out. They add some details to his powers later on that make it more interesting than this your usual time skip. When he goes with different people, there are people who try and trick him by taking him to different points in time so that you get a different perspective. It's very kind of sci-fi noir. Anyway, back to the strife. You, you're to blame for this, for all of it. If you hadn't decided to play God, if you hadn't brought about this glorious heroic age, my son would still be alive. Now Danny decides that he did this wrong. He should approach the street level heroes first, particularly the people that he actually already knows, like Devastatrix and Shimmerstorm. Now this issue establishes that Zoe and Coax are friends, which we'll see more developed in Zoe's issue. But Zoe was investigating crime blotter and ended up at Denny's apartment because the madman wrote stories about himself. So she was just looking for the expert on the crime blotter, which was him. And then he was there, passed out on his couch, in costume. Slick. Come on, Denny. She found his conspiracy board. That's never a good look. Issue too. Again, same creative team. Go! By the way, this cover was the winner by vote. So that's one of the sort of things you can vote on. Also, later in this issue, readers got to choose where Time Blotter took Devastatrix to prove he could really time travel. D-Day edged out the Titanic, but I kind of want to know his thought process for both. What was his plan? Danny decides to try and go and recruit Shimmerstorm. They do an interesting effect where with him, she's not out of phase. Since with his new powers, he also exists out of time in a way. And so now has a much better understanding of her. She says that she always knew he would ask and that her answer would be yes. We also see that Zeroth has a private space station observatory where he's just watching people at all times called the Zeus satellite. Look, you're already wearing a suit and had a white hair streak. Don't go down this path. You had so many tropes to overcome. Come on, Zeroth, you're the only one who knew you didn't have to pronounce the hashtag. He was the only one who got Zoe's name. Does being a potential villain make you hip with the kids? We see some training at the school and the professor is pretty brutal. Like he tells Coax to attack people's specific vulnerabilities, which he does with the help of another student, Bookworm, who's constantly studying all things like people's weaknesses, and he even tells her his brothers, I want to know more about how this is applied because the morality of it, again, it's fascinating to me. Are they gonna get into it? Are they not? Coax's powers are scary, but her look is sweet. Look at her belt, it's taking over the world, and I love it. I do like that despite her having a seemingly pretty hard design, Coax is actually a really considerate and thoughtful person. It's a nice juxtaposition and makes her feel more unique. Now again, as mentioned, this is an interconnected universe, so some moments here feel a bit abrupt, but then if you read some of the other issues, they're filled in. It can feel a bit choppy or like things are moving very quickly, at least for the first couple of issues, but the pacing starts to ease even out as the issues go on. Zoe here in these issues is very cavalier with her powers and uses them quite brazenly, like how she stops this carjacking by forcing the culprits to be angry with each other. She doesn't seem to have any concerns about how to use her powers, whereas in her own comics, she had just found out the extent of them and was a bit overwhelmed by it. And that in the timeline wasn't that long before this. Zoe has such strong villain potential. She's low key the purple man, but with emojis. And the fact that her and Coax's powers are similarly themed, there could be a great rivalry there. But enough about what I want. The two decide to use Coax's powers since she goes to the academy, and Zoe does not. They want to get information about the Nine out of Helios. She creates an image of his dead son at him. Just, wow. At least she's horrified while he lays sobbing, apologizing on the ground. Never mind. We'll be going and leaving the school. This was unforgivable. Yes. 
Yes, it was, but he says it was cruel, but necessary. Which will make sense next issue, because I was like, wow, no, expelled. Also, Time Blotter is striking out with teammate Devastatrix. She said no, even after he showed her that he could time travel by taking her to the middle of a battle in World War II, and also showing them making out back in the day. How could she say no to that? Now, all of this is being observed by Xeroth, who states they need to learn the truth about Phaeton, who is really the focus of issue three. Lots of the answers come in issue three, but there are no spoilers for that, not today. It's a strong issue overall. It does have multiple artists. Adrian Gutierrez, Scott McDaniel, Steve Ellis, and Cliff Richards. So there are a lot of styles. The swap isn't necessarily jarring, but it is noticeable. Reading issue three definitely makes all of the preceding issues stronger and come together. After reading it and rereading issues zero through two, a lot of the characters' reactions and motivations start to make more sense or become clearer. Actually seeing Phaeton, hearing him speak, and also seeing his descent into villainy made him more compelling and also made the things that happened before more concerning and the conflicted feelings that people had about them make more sense. Now overall, the strongest part of the Emergence Universe are the characters. They all feel distinct from one another and have unique motivations. I kept finding myself wanting to know more about them. For example, when I saw Bookworm levitating in an attic reading books that only exist up there in a full steampunk outfit, I wanted to know more about him. So then I sought out his little individual issue. It's a world that feels like the details are there just waiting to be fleshed out, but that there are answers they just haven't been revealed yet, or that there are overall plans for the characters, that there are stories that people want to tell with them, and excitement and energy behind it. Don't must we know it again, the vote system can end up playing a part in things. Now the pacing varies from issue to issue, but as mentioned, each issue gets stronger as wrinkles are ironed out and a groove is found. The art is fairly emotive, though at points lacking in intricate detail or taking a more loose approach. That will work for some, but not others. For me, it was an investment in the characters that kept me more absorbed than the mystery, which is as always with any mystery, a miles may vary type of deal. Also again, time travel. The fact that they do use time travel as part of the plot to try and trick time block is an interesting factor. The idea of the time traveler not only not being fully in control because people are actively deceiving him is an interesting one. If you're not a fan of people seeing like duplicate versions of themselves and stuff though, it may bother you. What I was left with ultimately after all of this was the desire to see these characters again. I'm excited for Zoe too. Zoe issue two is out now, by the way. I wanted to see all these characters go on more adventures and see the universe grow and get stronger, tighter, more smoothly connected. It's not perfect. And as mentioned, it still has its growing pains, but it has strong bones and it clearly wants to include its fans in the process. Will it be for everyone? Of course not, but it may be for you. And if you're interested, now you know where to check them out and how. If you're interested in picking up issue three, it is still available for sale. And there are a couple of variants still available as well for issue three and issue two. The variant covers are a bit more steep because they're limited edition, but as always, your money, your choice, you decide. Now just a couple of updates since last time I talked about this. Last time I made some complaints about the UI of the online reader. Well, since then there have been some updates. They have updated some of the options that you have on the bottom and how you can view panel by panel. So it's a bit more intuitive in that regard. It still doesn't always load the joy of reading digital comics. Is it the site or is it your own internet? Maybe it's Maybelline. They did say they're working on improving it and improvements were made even in that short time frame. Interpop have plans for even more improvements to the readership model in preparation for a bunch of drops coming this winter. Time of recording. Not gonna lie, I'm getting a bit too invested in Xeroth, so I need that smooth UI. The outcome of one of his votes is currently crushing my soul. There's a vote right now for who should return in the Emergence Presents where they flesh out the characters and everybody better be voting for Bookworm. Bookworm is intense. In his issue, he loses a fight to one of his bullies at school to inflict the psychological damage on his opponent by congratulating him and letting him know that this is the most he'll ever amount to in life ever. Bookworm don't play. So that was some more information and a look at the nine on interpopcomics.com. Is it something you're interested in checking out? Is Time Blotter a name you can get behind? Do you hope that Xeroth can subvert expectations despite all the villain archetypes he's lining up on his bingo card? Are you interested in a purely digital format? Share all your thoughts down below. While you're down there, please do all the YouTube things. Like, share, comment, subscribe, and hit the bell notification so that you never miss a vid. Thanks so much to Interpop Comics and thank you for taking this time of your day I spent discussing comics with me. I always appreciate it and I will see you again soon. Bye-bye.